one of the things I've said is that if you're going to have a character make a mistake, it needs to be, or I haven't said this, I think actually one of the patrons said it, is that mistakes can't be to push the plot forward. Mistakes need to be grounded in the character. And then I had said that, because I want my due, first of all, you guys need to understand that I am Papa William. Daddy is earned, not given. And the thing about it is that you want... <laughs> the dumbest shit ever. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to another several hours with your favorite podcast, uh, Unresolved Textual Tension. Today, it is just two of us, myself, Katie, and my ruggedly handsome co-host, William. That's right. You didn't forget my title this time, which is good. And what book are we doing? We are doing Three Parts Dead, um, author, Max me? Gladstone. Max Glatz, man, it writes like a man. Is it a man? I'm assuming. If it is a man, that makes so much sense. <laughs> what do you mean? Sometimes when you're a really, really skilled author, I can't like, uh, not that I'm like some great high deigned deity of telling mm -hmm. the gender of writers, but usually like, I feel like there's a distinctive stamp on feminine and masculine language. Now I'm talking about what you identify as, not as your literal physical gender. But there's like a certain way and... I actually get exactly what you're talking about. This is like, and it's not like any of the characters are sexist or anything, but it does feel a little male slanted. There's something pragmatic about even the purple prose parts of this piece. There's something about it that's just very like masculine in nature. So the book we're doing, uh, like Katie said, is three parts dead. Um, the basic uh, synopsis for this book is... God dies, necromancer detectives have to bring him back to life, which is super a cool. A really cool concept. I think it's really fun. It's almost so um, abstract that like, I feel like most people wouldn't be able to make this work or bring it together. It, it took a lot of uh, effort to make a cohesive theme and plot and series of like cause effect to make this all make sense. One of the things is, is that this is a Patreon live stream. This was a book club book, so it was picked by, um, by our patrons. Um, and so uh, if you would like to join our book stream live streams, uh, join our Patreon. Our Discord is also on our Patreon at a slightly lower tier. Uh, lots of cool, sexy people on there. It was interesting because I finished this book and I had thoughts about it. And then I went and read our final um, thoughts. Um, we have a, a channel on there for people to write down their final thoughts so that I don't have to go back through 900 uh, comments because our book club is growing. Um, and I was a little surprised by everybody else's opinion, but it also, the more I thought about it, makes a lot of sense. So they were somewhat less pleased with this book than I was. And you guys know, if you have watched this podcast, that I often have very strong ideas about what makes a good book and what makes a bad book. And if you're a good person for liking a book or a bad person and dumb. And this is a book that I think really is a uh, down to taste. Um, I think this book works for me because I like interesting world building. Uh, this book has really interesting world building. Um, I don't mind a faster like pace type book. And also um, I kind of like mystery books, um, like urban fantasy. Like there's a reason I made it through 19 Dresden Files books. So this was kind of like um, my thing. And then I liked how the writer wrote characters. We all was at the hot bitchy woman named Miss Kavarian because me too. She is a great character. Let's just put it like that. Um, and so this book kind of, this book worked for me, but I actually entirely understand the ways that it didn't work for other people. And then also the ways that the book is also kind of incoherent. What do you mean by incoherent? I'm curious. Cause I think I understand what you mean, but I'm not sure. In terms of like the character arc, it's a little hard to tell what the character arc is supposed to be. The themes don't quite culminate in like a message. They tend to just be more of like the asking questions type of theme. The book as a whole doesn't quite, again, come together thematically speaking, I felt like. Um, I also felt like the magic system is just a little too vague. Like I could never quite grasp what was going on. You know what's so funny? I had no problem with any of that, but that's so <laughs> weird. It's because you and I agree on a lot of things usually. Um, and we have very similar experiences, but I had no problem with the magic system in this and I understood everyone's personal themes. So that'll be interesting to get into. And I, I think part of it is, again, I, I think it's a little bit of a personal thing. The other thing to note about this book and what was really struck me right off the bat is that the tone is very distanced. Um, for the first like third of the book, I feel like there's very little interiority to the characters. It's omniscient. Yeah, almost. And I didn't feel like that was a massive problem because 
I still f and I still found the characters um, enjoyable, even if I didn't connect with them. No, yeah, I thought all that stuff was fine. It was just all so boring. We'll we'll go through again. I think there's a lot of valid ways to read this book. Um, but the thing about it is because the characters are distant, it's hard to feel like anything is emotionally that intense. I talked, um, funnily enough, a book I'm going to uh, compare this to a lot is Nine Fox Gambit, which you didn't read, but our patrons did. Um, and one of the things about it is that like that book, also had a very distant tone and but the characters i didn't find as enjoyable as i did in this book but one of the things i also talked about there is that not caring about the characters can cause a cascade failure in terms of plot stakes and then uh how much you care about the themes and then how, like all these it causes like basically the basis of fiction is that we think we're the characters or we relate to them somehow. I felt like that's maybe one of the reasons this book didn't this book didn't really work for people is it took a while to really get into the characters. Um, and even then you may not have. So again, I think I think this will actually be an interesting discussion, especially with what um, all the patrons um, think. I really wish I had been able to read this. At la I told William right before we started the stream. I wish I'd been able to read this physically with my eyes because I feel like it would have affected my um, my experience of it. But I did listen to it at 1.5 times speed. And I obviously to the audiobook, um, which on a brief side note, the audiobook is not it's not the worst, but it's like there, it's kind of weird. It's because there are these weird lull moments where the narrator will or, uh, you know, the yeah, the narrator will um, go monotone for like the same character, though. It's not as if anyone's speaking or anything. It's just like really, really excited and really full of emotion. And then it is suddenly narrated like this. And it was very off-putting. But beyond that, what's interesting is I, I felt like this. <sighs> I've read a couple of things that are like this style where it's almost uh, movie in the way it goes from scene to scene. In fact, I'm pretty sure the author is drawing, I don't want to say too much from movie structure, but they're definitely mimicking it in a way that usually is not supposed to work in literature. There are several scenes where there's multiple perspectives happening and you get blips of each of the characters' experience, almost as if you're getting like, you know, a collage effect of like, uh oh, this is the climactic point. We're going to go from character to character to character. So that way you see all of the climactic points for each character subplot come together into one. And it did work for me in this case, but it, you, it really shouldn't for most uh, books. It's because usually the, the structure of a novel is you know, obviously not the same as a movie. It's a lot more extensive and there are things that you can't rely upon, such as the visuals in a movie. But I thought this book did a pretty good job with it. And <clears throat> I really liked the narration style and how distanced it was. I felt like I got just enough that I thought was appropriate of the characters to not be invested in them like I would in other books where I'd be passionate about that book. I'm not passionate about this book. There are certain things that require uh, that I require for me to love something. And that requires more emotion, which then would need a closer inspection upon character feelings and interactions, stuff like that. But I really, really like this process and i like how the the focus was on the intellectualism between the characters or the the detectiving um rather than the characters themselves and it worked for me in this case as well as the magic system seemed fine to me it had undefined dimensions to it but i didn't mind it um in fact i appreciated that uh and then i really enjoyed the approach that they had to introducing the different aspects of the world. And I think it really works that Tara is not from Old Colum. It's because Old Colum's freaking weird and very steampunky. Uh, and I think the biggest thing that I was most confused about was the concept of the God Wars, which we'll get into later on. And like the way the earth is split between technological advance slash craft magic slash whatever and all of that. But Overall, I really liked this book. I would not reread it. I wouldn't reread it, but I actually, if, okay, so if this wasn't, if we didn't do the podcast, I would probably read the sequel. I'd be like, oh, that's kind of good. Um, but because of the podcast, I don't think I'll read the sequel. Um, I think that 
you're right in that, especially the finale has a very Star Wars, oh, look what's happening in plot A, plot B in the climax, you know, like Vader's fighting on the ship and then they're on Endor dealing with the teddy bears and then like all these different jumps back and forth. And I think that works better in a movie than it does in a book. I thought it worked okay here, um, but it's not taking advantage of the medium, I think, in the ways that a book can. Uh, yeah, it's not, not quite as strong as in a media, as in visual media. Because there are certain like scenes where it literally is described in the way that it would be revealed visually via a movie. Like, um, I think there was one scene where it described, you know, the uh, inscriptions on her skin. I think that's what it was. It was towards the beginning. And I was like, wow, this is he's doing this or they whatever are doing this like a movie scene rather than a than a novel. In my a Song of Ice and Fire, Will's A Song of Ice and Fire hour, which you guys is a it's a Patreon exclusive right now. But one of the things I talked about is the way he structures sentences sometimes is very visual, but I don't think it's cinematic exactly so like one of the examples in the one was the horse bled out uh with a neigh uh cal drogo's face a pearl oval and okay i'm not saying it right in the water but it's it's he'll pair um an action he'll have an action or an event a description and then um some passive information like it's a passive sentence but it feels very active because your attention is being drawn from one thing to another and then another and then that's the last thing is a little bit of a punch um and so there are ways, I think, to bring in visualization in an interesting way in a novel. But yeah, I felt like at times this was very more like he's writing what he, he's looking at a movie than um, really taking advantage of being in a character's head. And that's kind of the thing is I think that's what books are very good at is being in someone's thought process because that's like a thing only they can really do. Um, and eh, here it's it's OK. Again, I. I actually kind of, I enjoyed reading this book, which is like very strange because a lot of books we've read, I don't. And I think the book actually is quite competent in a lot of ways, but I can definitely see how it didn't work for people. Also, unfortunately, it's unfortunate that Maria isn't here for this um, episode because this has a ton of intricate plot that I just straight up don't remember exactly I can, how. I remember it. it. Hi guys, I'm here to save you from Katie and Will. I know, you need a break. With this week's Indie Ad Corner, sponsored by our Author of the Week. In our Indie Ad Corner, we introduce you to new indie books that we have not read and cannot provide any assurances to quality or content, but we are helping indie authors advertise their books to more eyes. So enjoy this week's Indie Ad Corner. Vincent Hoover is a 14-year-old boy who lives in the town of Sleepy Hollow with his mother and his older sister. During the past few months, Sleepy Hollow has been plagued with a rapid spree of mysterious kidnappings that have been pushing the town's people over the edge of desperation. With the police unable to locate the missing people and one person found dead, Vincent began to believe that Sleepy Hollow was heading towards a dark fate. Then, an encounter with Frankenstein's monster reveals to him that not only are the unknown forces behind the kidnapping monsters of the supernatural kind, but that he is the reincarnation of the legendary monster hunter Van Helsing. With the hopes of protecting the ones he loves and the people of Sleepy Hollow, Vincent takes the role of Van Helsing as a masked vigilante, making the people debate whether he was the world's first superhero or the menace that caused all the chaos. With the assistance of Frankenstein's monster, Vincent goes into battle with these monsters in the hopes of putting a stop to their end goal only known as the Day of Reckoning. But as time continues to run out and the situation grows ever more dire, it starts becoming unclear to Vincent whether he will be strong enough to prevent the monsters from bringing forth the end of the world. Be sure to pick up a copy of Van Helsing, the first book of the infamous universe saga, an interconnected storyline that consists of heroes and villains, gods and monsters, good and evil, and the blurred lines between them all. Why don't you start us off with um, the the beginning. So we start off in a very dramatic fashion. We have our main protagonist. Uh, uh, oh my God, shame though. I'm uh, blanking out on her name Tara. right now. Thank you very much. I literally just said it. Tara is being graduated from the cities in the clouds, which are the schools of craft. Um, in this world, craft is something that humans can draw upon from the stars and from soul stuff, whatever that is, uh, stuff from souls, I'm assuming. And um, they can mirror or nigh become gods in utilizing this power, um, minus the immortality and non-rot of the body over time. 
um, which is a key plot point later on for some motivating factors. Uh, so Tara has been cast out like Satan himself and uh, from the heavens and into the crack of the world, as they call it. And she survives um, by ballooning her soul uh, behind her like a parachute, which is a fascinating concept. Um, they, in this world, they can make the non-material more physical uh, through their like craft magic. And so she gets cast down upon the earth and she licks her wounds over time in a very fun, like r third Riddick movie style fashion. <laughs> well, okay, so here's what's interesting is that you're basically not in her head at this point. I mean, I think there's some thoughts here and there, but it feels very much like you're just watching her from afar, third person style. But I think Tara gets away with, I think the author gets away with it to a certain extent because Tara has very strong actions. This is again, something I talked about in my uh, Song of Ice and Fire hour but uh if you have strong dialogue and strong decisive actions that will characterize a character um more than specifically being in their head so there's a, a case in that chapter where for two pages you don't know what the character is thinking and this very dramatic scene but you're with the character the whole time um and in this case i think that's why he gets away with it but i did feel like tara was a little bit like there's a floatiness to it that i could see would be hard to connect with Really quickly though, Lindbergh came in clutch. When they let the stallion fall, the bath was dark red and nothing showed of Drogo but his face, was the exact quote. Lindbergh, what? <laughs> what do you just have? An entire compendium of quotes? She was, she was there with us. She was there with us. No, what's interesting about it is, just from a writing perspective, I'll cut this out, but look how these are all sort of passive sentences, but the When they the let the stallion them, fall, dependent clause, the bath was dark red, independent, compound sentence and nothing showed of Drogo but his face. It's a really nice sentence. And there's a lot of stuff going on. It's all passive, but it comes together to be active and you can see the attention going from one thing to the next. It's just because it's clearly written and it becomes, because you're right, it's fully passive with, well, that's not true. It starts with a pot passive clause and then it continues onwards into a more direct one. But the poetic quality is actually similar. And this is what Will was saying before in this book as well. And I actually found a lot of aspects of this book to be similar to my own writing, which is maybe why I enjoyed it. So maybe people won't like my writing. <laughs> anyway, there's this one part that's literally in the reason I said the third Riddick movie, AKA Riddick. Um, there's this one scene where he's laying face down and this bird comes by and he's like, and he grabs the bird by the throat and yanks it down and then he eats it later. That's literally what Tara, Abernathy, thank you very much, whoever threw that in earlier. Uh, Judo Shu. Um, that is what Tara Abernathy does to get food at the beginning. And it's just, again, because it's so strong and it's um, like, Will, that's a good point, is the decisive physical movements help mm -hmm. define the internal dialogue and therefore, sh like, they tell the story instead of the more internal stuff or the, even the more passively like described stuff that novels usually rely upon. And so what happens after that is she's able to crawl back to her home, um, uh, back like- Edgemont. It's, yeah, and it's like a podunk town. They don't trust those big time magicians, so she doesn't tell anybody. And she kind of licks her wounds there and heals herself, but she's also kind of bored because she really wanted to do craft and stuff. And this is kind of told to you and not super shown. Um, she eventually tries to raise the dead to help out the town. The town gets like really pissed about it. It's really funny actually and really cool in my opinion. So there's this, um, she hasn't been using her craft and there's this uh, one evening where there's an attack and the, some of the guards that were on, on station in that evening had passed away and been killed. And so I like this series of events. She's almost like the Grinch or like, uh, or it's like the Nightmare Before Christmas vibe where it's like, doo -doo 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 -doo. and uh, <laughs> uh, she leaves her home and she's like, well, of course this makes sense. Uh, it's a, it's a really fun sort of whimsical scene where uh, she's like, this makes the most sense. And you don't know what she's going to do just yet. Um, and she's like, this is the most straightforward answer to their problem, even though it might be seen as gross and blasphemous. <laughs> blasphemous. There we go. 
And so anyway, she goes to the graves and she digs them up and she cackles as because of the power and the, the, the independence and the, the fun that she has with the craft. And she just like revives the dead. But unfortunately, this has garnered attention from the local people. And it is a great character flaw seeing Judo Shrew. I like that, like, she has been overcome by this. It really defines her that this power is something she lives for. And as she cackles and does this, all of the people come by and they think that she's like a raider because she's shrouded in darkness and they can't see her. And she doesn't want them to see her. It's because otherwise they're going to be like, ah, the family. Uh, the Abernathy family has like a witch amongst them. And uh, my one of my favorite parts is the fact that there are these guards that come up and they run up and I forget what it is that she calls them, but they're wearing armor or like pads or something. And in the armor, they are these big, like hulking, intimidating warriors that come to fight her. But then once uh, it slips off or if if Tara uses her sight to see beyond it, it's just the fat gut dude underneath it wearing <laughs> like, armor or the dude with like the 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 snaggle tooth or whatever it is, you know, like just the country bumpkin dudes. But they're wearing magical stuffs in order to fight. And I helped I, that helped me root in that magic is an accepted part of the world, just not all magic. So it's interesting um, because. I felt like this didn't really quite work for me because I felt like there was a mismatch between the Looney Tunes-ness of what was going on and the distance. So distance and comedy can work quite well. Um, Guards, Guards by Terry Pratchett. I didn't love that book, but it worked very well there. Um, Maria and Gina uh, just read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which I was editing. And that also has like that that Looney Tunes distant, but also very myopic, myopic Britishness to it. Here, it didn't quite work. A, this, I don't... I don't buy that Tara, the Tara we see in the rest of the novel would do something like this where she would think that the town would just be okay with it later. Like that just, that seems incredibly naive. Yeah, no, it does. No, it does. That, that's a good point to point out. But I also think you also have to consider it's because we don't know her very well yet. So it works out initially. Um, but also, uh, she's been isolated and she's away from everything and she hasn't used that power in a while. So I think this is a brief, like, I think this is a, an appetizer to the uh, corruption theme. Well, okay, so that's actually a really good point. And I think, again, one of the places the distance hurts. One of the things I've said is that if you're gonna have a character make a mistake, it needs to be, or I haven't said this, I think actually one of the patrons said it, is that mistakes can't be to push the plot forward. Mistakes need to be grounded in the character. And then I had said that, because I want my due, first of all, you guys need to understand that I am Papa William and the smartest. Um, Daddy is earned, not given. And the thing about it is that you want to have, <laughs> <laughs> the dumbest shit that. ever <laughs> for readers to understand a character mistake you really need to understand why they're doing it and i don't understand why she did this i don't feel that in that moment like what you said makes sense that's not something i felt from the narrative at this point because it's maybe mentioned that's why she's doing it but you don't feel it it's again i think the place the distance doesn't quite work but i think at this point in the novel it worked okay because i was like oh this is kind of tara this is a little bit supposed to be a little bit funny that's another thing is i think this book is a little unserious at times i felt it makes sense as establishing her it does but it then doesn't really make sense with what she does later she's later a very savvy person i think that's also because she's under the tutledge though of um miss Cavarian. tutelage Whatever. Tutledge sounds like it's a thing a turtle does, like a British old lady turtle. Yeah. So, like, I'm fine with it. It's because she's under the thumb of an, observa an observing eye of her behavior after that, whereas prior to that, she was a wild agent. So I can be convinced of that. I'm not fully convinced. I, I don't think it's, well, I don't think it's elegant, but I'm okay with that. No, I get that. Again, I think this is something where your preferences will change. And again, this is something where like, I liked the character, but I didn't feel compelled by her in the, or engaged as in some other characters. Judo, she says something. That is fair. I don't fair. think she's savvy with Abelard at all. She looks at God's corpse and says, fuck you. I'm you, but better. But she's very aware of like how people are going to interact with her in like the real world in terms of like the whole mob. I understand what you're Because the big saying. thing is that like her big arc words are like, oh, the mob is following, like the mob is watching because she grew up in a town where magic just wasn't cool, but she wanted to reach for the stars. Um, 
this is told to us several times, but I never quite felt it. Again, there's a problem where like I don't quite feel her character. It's a little bit informed. Um, and one thing that um, Lindbergh had said is Tara has a strong capacity for brutality. I sort of wish this book was her corruption arc instead of the other way around. All Nietzsche style, he who fights monsters, etc. This is actually a really good point. Tara does a lot of things that are like not very nice, um, but the you don't really get a sense for it because the narrative is very sort of light and a little bit funny. Well, at the same time, and that's another thing is I feel like the tone of this book is a little bit um, not quite, it's not quite Gideon the Ninth and it's not quite not supposed to be funny it's just like a little bit funny so like at one point uh the character she's saying about donovan is like he went he came he went from being a god back to his body and just a man and i thought it would have been funnier if he's she was like um and he he stopped being a god and went back to his body and just being a dick like that would have been a funnier line and like it would have been a little bit more hyperbolic in the way that you can be funny in a book but it just isn't quite again i've kind of uh, I, I think been spoiled by the dresden files which does have more of that tone and that's another thing that the, the book will try to be explaining is that craft people kind of become like over time they become cold and they lose their humanity and like that's supposed to be i think where this is one of the things that I mean by when I say that the, the book poses questions but doesn't really answer them is it's like, oh, she's starting down this path, but does she want to go down this path? And I never felt like that was a temptation for her. We'll talk more about it in terms of the end of the book, but to me, it just didn't. Yeah, I would say that I was told it was a temptation, but infrequently felt like it was a temptation, whereas the addiction of Cat felt like something that was an addiction versus... Mm -hmm the um you know just the the narrative uh bits of saying that you know like the internal dialogue and such for tara saying i like this power so the next thing that happens is as she is attempting to re or not attempting she has resurrected her uh fallen neighbors from uh her small town but miss kavarian comes around in her pin uh, not in, in a pinstripe suit she's not in a pinstripe suit but she is and or maybe she is <laughs> i don't remember but she's in a suit and she comes around and she's like, this is pro bono work. I don't see what the anger is uh, or where this anger comes from. Uh, please unhand my assistant and uh, here's my card. And there's not, I thought that was so funny is because the townspeople are so unfamiliar with seeing paper outside of a book that they take the card and they're like, what is this? <laughs> so one thing to explain is that Miss Kavarian is um, a member of a legal law practice of wizards, which again are kind of like necromancer wizards. Um, and she was there when, so we'll talk about how that concept I think is much more interesting than it is developed in the book. Um, and um, she basically, before Tara fell, had given her a, a business card and was like, hey, come seek me out um, later. And then she had shown up to save her. And she is like, she's a, I actually really liked her character. I think she's the best character in the book. She's very snarky, funny, but also very like upper class, hot bitchy. Uh, maybe not hot because she's literally cold. She's, she's the most 70. dynamic character with exception to Kat. Yes, she is in a very dynamic character. She comes across really well. Um, and that's what I mean is that the book is competent in ways that a lot of the books we haven't read are like there there are distinct characters with distinct voices here who are interesting to listen to that aren't just the whiny ya protagonist one thing we didn't talk about is that at the very beginning of the book there is a prologue where um this one guy who's smoking and is a priest is watching the fire of his god Kos, who runs the city and all of a sudden Kos stops talking to him and what we find out in a little bit is that Kos is dead and so um, that's where that kind of part ends. And then we go back and then you can skip back to Miss Kavarian and Tara. Miss Kavarian picks up Tara like a cab service and they fly around on lightning and pick up some books for Tara to study. It's because they have a job and Miss Kavarian would like Tara to assist her. And she is currently still in the process of determining whether or not Tara should be an assistant or a colleague. And also in the process of this, Tara has been informed that this is, or she's about to be informed, um, that this is going to be a test for her, for the uh, the group, what's it called? The attorney group, whatever. I forget what they're called. Something, something, and something. Yeah, it's names. Dunder Mifflin. Yeah, we'll call it Dunder Mifflin. It's fine. So she can be hired by Dunder Mifflin if she... Uh, proves herself to be a helpful 
colleague slash assistant. So they are on their way over to an old city called Old Kalum. And Old Kalum is powered by a god. Not just any god, but as we just said, or specifically William just said, Kos, the god of flame and other things. And <laughs> this god's power uh, is kind of like I saw it as like veins in the city. So this very large central area that is a church um, has a whole bunch of like pipes and connections. Basically, it's steampunk powered by a god is kind of which I think is really cool. I thought it was cool. I didn't. I was a little disappointed in that if you're going to have a city powered by a god, why is it's just like a normal it's ba he's basically just a nuclear reactor. Like the actual magic of being a god doesn't affect like their machinery and stuff. Like I thought it would have been more. No. But see, like that to me is just a tad boring as you're just swapping a god for a battery for like a nuclear nah, reactor. No, not necessarily because it's, un but that's something to be, I mean, that's something to be worshipped. We, we go to, I mean, just think of nuclear energy and why we even pursue it. I mean, that's not true. We pursue it for war ends. But also, like, the whole purpose is unending renewable energy uh, by prayer. So it's really a nice deal for a city. Like, where else are you going to get your resources from? Whatever, depending on your, or your, you know, your geography. And I don't know. They don't really go mm -hmm. into the geography around this city. But anyway... So uh, Miss Kavarian and Tara are flying on a cloud lightning. It's I had a hard time picturing this part. And I kept thinking uh, of it as a mar magic carpet. <laughs> I know, basically, but I imagine the lightning is rains and then they're just riding like a cloud thing. Yeah, that makes sense. They hit us uh, like a dead zone and they drop and Miss uh, uh, Miss Kavarian uh, saves herself and Tara balloon shoots her soul out of her body again and uh, falls in the water and is rescued by a vampire pirate, which I thought was fun. I didn't love the inclusion of vampires. It just felt very like normal to me. Like it just felt a little bit like one of those worlds where like, oh, and we have all these other things. Let's let's throw the kitchen basket at it. I didn't hate it. I just didn't think it was. I, I, I don't think it hurts the book, but I didn't love it. Um, the other thing we need to talk about is the backstory. And the backstory for this world kind of gets doled out as the book goes on. This is one of the things people didn't like is that there's a lot of telling about the backstory of the world. Um, and I actually did like that because honestly, I will read a textbook about the history of a world. Um, and in this case, it's interesting and it's it's not told in the most textbooky way. There is um, a certain amount of like in character reason that they're talking about this. Um, and I just like weird worlds and stuff. Um, so basically speaking, at some point, people, there were gods in this world and it's 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 not clear if this is our world after an apocalypse or another world after like an apocalypse type event. I assume it's an alternate universe it's not our world but it's our world and slightly different there were gods that were real in this world and then at some point humans were like hey we don't have to do god we don't have to worship the gods and get power from them we can come up with our own magic and then the gods got pissed about this and this was called the god war which happened like i don't know like 20 years ago or something like that no and no 40 40 because later on they say um oh my gosh it's really killing me that i can't think of his name her professor donovan it's not his name is it isn't it donovan his the professor the evil professor i don't think so our patrons will let us know in a minute yeah it's because look the uh the group was called calathras albrecht Deneo. yeah yeah that was funny it's de novo de novo yes because uh he and kavarian had come 40 years 50 years prior to do that work okay yeah and so the thing is 40 years prior there was a god war where the gods didn't like that mages were taking over so they fought the deathless kings which are essentially like mages who live a really really long time um and kind of lose their humanity over time they become skeletons or statues um which is actually what's happening to Miss Kavarian. She's like 70, but looks like she's 50 and she's kind of turning cold slowly. And it's supposed to, again, be kind of like one of these things like, oh, is Tara going to become like that as she follows this path? I didn't feel like this was a strong temptation or conflict. I don't think it was supposed to be. I think it was supposed to, I, I think it's supposed to be laying groundwork for a sequel. Yeah, I think so as well. But it's one of these things that I feel like doesn't quite work for the conflict in this book or the character growth in this book. Um, mm -hmm. And so in this war, um, a bunch of gods died, specifically one of the gods of the city of Abel, the new city they're going to, Abel? Ur Columbo? What is it called? Old. Old Columbo. Columb, yes. Old Columb. One of the gods there was Cyril, who was the god of night, who was like the lover of the god of fire, um, and she died. 
And specifically when she died, um, there's this thing that happens where a god, even when they die, all of their contracts that they've made in life to give people power still remain, like the, the skeleton of it still kind of remains. And so you have to have lawyers figure out like who was at fault, who gets punished. And basically that's what Miss Kaverian did last time is she like, figured out who was at fault and they like hurt a bunch of the priests and it was not pretty um, because the debtors essentially come in and and want the gods magic for like so basically the the gods are essentially like banks of like magical power that you can like loan money from loan, loan power from and give back specifically cost though they didn't say this is essentially like the US dollar to the world in that he's like the most stable of the gods to get power from. So if he falls, it calls a create concept. Tested. Yeah, it was really cool. And basically you can resurrect a god. It's just, it will be, it still has essentially the form of the old god and a god and it will um, uphold all of their contracts. They have to do a magical god bailout, basically. So basically when Cyril died, they, uh, Miss Kaverian came in, figured out who did the wrong thing. The priest got punished and then a new god basically took her place called Justice. It's important to note that um, uh, De Novo, Professor De Novo, AKA Alexander De Novo, uh, the partner of Kaverian during the God War, uh, when he came in and he took the remaining pieces of Cyril and sewed them back together, he created Justice, which he specifically says at one point he made blind, um, which is a double entendre for something else that happens. Um, but, uh, justice is more like, I, I saw it more like an AI. It's not like a fully functioning being. It's actually a hive mind of everybody else in the city. So the black suits are the police who basically let justice take over their bodies temporarily for a short period and get her power. And that's a concept I really liked. Again, he's very good. The author is very good at world building and it's fun to explore this world just in its own right. Um, if you find that kind of stuff interesting, some people don't really care. Don't, don't find alternate just like um world's interesting and like i do so it really worked for me how much you like it will i think very much influence how much you like the book i just wanted to notate about the black suits because i know i'm going to forget about it later it's because it's a smaller detail that's not relevant to big plot points but i wanted to point out it is much much later at the big climactic piece um described that when de novo created justice he created the black suits or the process of the black suits uh, taking over people as being addictive. So he, uh, they can experience all of the power of the exchange between a god and a mortal, but none of the love and support and like healthy, healthy. It's not a healthy relationship, basically. Mm -hmm. He, it's basically him. Uh, but a whole bunch of hymns because he's a big old unhealthy relationship person. Yeah, so we'll, we'll get into that with Victoria's character too. Um, the other important thing to remember about the God War is once Cyril died, or earlier she had had go uh, not golems, uh, gargoyles that like were the police of the city and they really loved her and they really, really hated that she died and they messed up the city and so they got exiled and they'll come back into the plot. Um, but at this point, they, uh, Miss Kaverian and Tara get to the city. They're like, oh, somebody tried to murder us, but now we need to go do the actual case we got, like, we, we came here to do. Because they should not have fallen out of the sky. There is no reason right. that they should have fallen out of the sky. Miss Kaverian, at first, Tara thinks it was a test uh, from Kaverian, but Kaverian says, no, no, I intended to land us on this vampire boat, pirate boat. Um, I, <laughs> I, I was not expecting this. This is an issue, but an issue for not now. The other thing that had happened in another chapter was that, um, there was a judge, um, in the city of Alt Kulum who, um, was like, oh, I'm doing this new business with my son who showed up, uh, and he drank his tea and then he died. And that's one of the first things they're going to investigate. But first, they go to see the temple. Um, and the priest we mentioned in the prequel, the young priest who was like smoking a cigarette is called Abernathy? Abelard? There you go. Abelard, which I I don't love because it's way too close to Abernathy, and I'm not actually even sure it's Abelard. Um, and he's he's one of the other viewpoint characters that we follow, and I actually liked him. I think he's a fun character in that he's like just very normal and out of his depth. I really, really liked his solo chapter more than anyone else's, um, which surprised me because I didn't really care overly much about his character. But there's something... Um, gritty and like i i thought his childhood references was like weak sauce like there's this uh <laughs> brief like you know it's trying to describe him as a young boy 
Um, and it's like the world that he lives in is full of these boiler rooms and underground secret areas and stuff, but it's all hot and cold. It's because it's powered by uh, the heat of costs, but also cooled down and controlled by the coolness of um, Serral's like magic. And uh, it's a really cool concept and everything, but that childhood stuff just, it, it, it served really no purpose other than the fact that he knew where he was going when he was later on in a scene in the boiler rooms um, beneath. But um, I really enjoyed the concept that he ended up bringing to life at the end of the book with his cigarette, the ever burning cigarette. That was clever. Um, so that's the other thing is that this book does try to explore the different relationships that people have with God. Um, and that, you know, he is the, the, uh, I think Judo True said here, Abelard is all about his relationship with God versus relationship with the church. This is one of those things where like, I don't think it's explored as much as it could be in that I didn't feel like there was a, uh, a real, you know, one of the things I talk about is if you're going to have a character go through, um, loss. character growth and loss, they need to actually go through challenges that challenge them and make them grow each time. And for me, it felt very much like he was a little bit too simple to really explore that concept. And so I didn't feel like that quite came together. The The book, again, really wants to, ex well, that's the thing is it doesn't really want to explore. It wants to pose that there's different kinds of relationships with God. And so we'll meet another character later who's kind of addicted to her relationship with God. Um, there's another character who actually gets kind of annoyed when his, and does bad things when his god starts doing things he doesn't want him to um and those i thought it's one of the ways that the book i think is competent in that it asks these questions and sets up these characters in a way that so many of the books we've read haven't but i didn't feel like it really came to a particularly good completion of those arcs i think partly because the characters just aren't on screen a lot and they don't really go through challenges where they have to slowly i've talked before about this one warhammer book where the character starts, um, she's a psyker, and so she's kind of left out by society, but she does her job, and then she gets betrayed by the bureaucracy, but she goes, okay, the bureaucracy is corrupt, but I'm working for the people, and then the people reject her, and she's like, I forget that, I'm working for the emperor, and then he rejects her, and she goes, fuck it, I'm joining chaos and banging a hot space marine, chaos space marine. Uh, not a Slanishy one, though, so if you're going to pick one, pick one. I always bring up that book because, to me, that book was a good example of characters having to go through, it really tearing down, it really tore down the main character's um, different beliefs and through specific acts in the book, like challenges. And I don't really quite feel that happens here. Um, so one thing that Judo Shrew says is, I think that his whole arc is that he didn't need to prove himself in the church. It's not the strongest, but I think it's still there, and I like it. Yeah, that's not an arc. That's He has an arc, though. It's it's not his arc, it's the theme. Okay, so the problem is that part of it is that the character's starting points are a little vague. So Abelard starts off um, a kind of unsure of himself, but he doesn't, by the end of the book, he isn't that much sure of himself. He doesn't reject the evil fire pope that we'll get to. He just is kind of like, oh, my God is all I needed all along. Um, and then um, Pearl says, I think Gladstone wanted to leave the answers to the reader, though. Drew says, yeah, I can't do all the work for the reader. I don't actually, that's not a, a reading of text that I particularly like is the, it's up to the readers. I'm okay with that. It's up to the readers if it's an interesting question that you can't really answer. But like, but what's the... What's up to the readers? I actually, I think they were talking about like whether, like all the God stuff. I, I had assumed they were talking about like uh, characters and their relationship to God and what was right and what wasn't. Um, but to me, that was just kind of ambiguous and uh, ambiguous in a way that it was muddy instead of being ambiguous um, to me. Also, because I think how important religion is Religion or lack thereof is important to people. I think Gladstone did a good job of recognizing that there isn't a universally correct answer here. Lindbergh said, I wonder if my upbringing is such an extremely secular nation in areas why I didn't connect with this book at all. Yeah, that yeah. actually is a good point because I'm extremely atheist and like this book that, so there's actually kind of a problem in that this book wants to talk about the relationship with God, but God is real in these books. And that sort of fundamentally is different than in real life. I'm sorry, guys. Sorry, I just, I was reading Judo. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I read Judo Shrew's comment and it does make a really good point. It is an arc. So much of his grief is that he's trying to prove himself as a novice technician and he is failing and is turmoil about his position in the church, but he realizes he can't trust them and gets to build up on just his relationship with Koss on his own. It's why he doesn't ask to move upward at the end. But what relationship does he have with Koss on his own? That That is never explored. It's a, it's a personal one because he comes to him and talks to him. 
Remember, yeah, that was the whole point s- of the technicians. It happens twice uh, where Koss comes to talk to him. We just don't hear the conversation. OK, there you go. Um, and so but like that's the thing is it's not really explored why he's like this. We don't really know much about Abelard. And again, this is a thing where the lack of intensity and interiority of the characters causes a problem, because if this was a more intense book, you could understand why the character you could feel the characters need that god or something like that but you can't feel it so you and and there aren't really moments of it in the book to show it so for example one of the things i talked about is um you know decisive action um and so the really the most decisive abelard action abelard takes is that he keeps smoking cigarettes even though it's bad for him because it was a thing his god like that was a thing he did as a priest um but that's more almost treated as a joke and then it's a plot line later um and so i think that's one of the things is it's not explored really in the book why he needs God that much and why and what he felt like with God. It's just mentioned that he had a personal relationship and felt kinship with God. I think the scene where he's above Koss's corpse is the best, like when it when we get it from his perspective. There's this description, I think it's then, and if it's not sometime else, whatever. But it does he does go into some internal gymnastics of the loss he feels and how he feels like He's missing like a father, basically, or an older brother type of vibe. Like, and he doesn't say that, but I agree. I would have liked to see that explored in a scene, though. Like, let's say that, like, he once went to his god for um, confidence in terrible moments, and then he couldn't feel that, or he had a moral um, complexity, and he went to pray to his god, and he realized, my god is not going to answer. This kind of gets into a problem, though, which is that what I was saying before is that uh, I'm sorry, guys, but God in the real world is. You can either say he's not real or you can say he has no impact on the world, either one you want to talk about. But by making them an active, real character, they're no longer actually gods. They're more like really powerful beings. They exist, which fundamentally changes the point how religion works because religion in the real world doesn't. I'm uh, I'm sorry, I'm atheist. This is just how we're going to talk about it. But basically, the problem with that is that faith isn't... um, a thing you feel between you and God, it's an actual conversation you're having with a real person. Um, there's that whole thing about if you speak to God, that's praying, but if God speaks to you, that's schizophrenia. He doesn't have a relationship with God. He has a relationship with a real being who has real wants and um, agency and will do things. Um, and that is more like a cult, not a cult leader, but that's more of like a spiritual leader than it is a God. So at one point, the evil fire pope um, is mad that the god is doing something he doesn't want and like then is like hey i'm gonna he he, spoiler alert he kills costs um or tries to but that's not a thing you can do to god because god in the real world doesn't have agency in that way you're just trying to interpret from like the bible so that's where i feel like i think this book does a really good job again they're gods as in higher beings but i don't think they're supposed to be like god 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 some people view them as god 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 but not but for example the um the craftswomen and such and like all those people the that you know attend the schools they don't see them as that it's because they're not and so it just depends on what level of education you have which is a nice mirror to some degree to like the like how atheism can build up but i also wanted to mention that i think the author does do a good job though at Notice we, the only god or goddess that we hear talk ever directly is Cyril. And that's in, uh, uh, through Tara's, uh, like, you know, self. And I kind of wish she had not spoken because what I really enjoyed about the fact that they didn't speak is it made them feel removed and more godlike. Even though they're spoken of as if they are higher beings, uh, it felt more like an actual god in the way that they were removed. And one of my favorite scenes, uh, not like because I like thought it was fun or anything, but just because I liked what it did, was when you view that um, ether as a bar towards the end, and Cyril sitting at the bar um, metaphorically with a with a you know a drink, and then uh, Koss comes in and he looks exhausted. And they can't interact because they're both hurt, but he just puts his hand on her shoulder and she puts his or her or something like that. And he, uh, she puts his hand on uh, or her hand on his. And there's this very like human moment in that. And I think that's that's really supposed to define the way the gods are supposed to be in this world. They are human. They're just 
more powerful. I think that's true. And I think that's really good. But I don't think you can necessarily talk about faith when you're talking about something that's real. Um, again, I come from the, to, to this side with a very atheist background. So one thing Lindbergh had said is, my interaction with religion and the questions I find interesting about it pertains more to could some kind of God exist and sort of the argument Ivan makes in the Brothers Karamazov that if God doesn't exist, he should be invented because perhaps humans need something to believe in. And by making a God a visible being, you lose part of this exploration I find interesting around God. That's actually a really good point is that one of the more interesting things I find about religion is how it's made up and how it really is just a reflection of culture. Um, and, you know, it, one of the you know prime examples of this is how people just kind of make up stuff like um and read into the bible what they want to in terms of like the the judaic um or the abrahamic yeah the abrahamic sorry the word the bible uses for homosexuality is a sin is the same word it uses for men who have long hair and eating shellfish and like y how many homophobic people do you know that eat shellfish like that or well nobody eats shellfish but like they would not consider that to be on the same level people pick and choose what they want based off of what the cultural needs are and that's religion in the real world religion in the real world is not a being doing things it is a culture creating um a story and a spiritual language one thing i once heard uh, reza aslan he, he's like a scholar um on on religious topics um one thing he once talked about is that religion is a spiritual language to describe spiritual things with other people and i think that's one of the things people often don't realize about religion is religion is three like three big things it's a science which is why does the sun come out you know helios is pulling it by his chariot in a lot of cases it's a failed science in that the, what it can explain is getting smaller and smaller as our extending grows. It's a spiritual language, which is still something that's used quite a lot. And it's an expression of culture. And those are kind of like three separate things all tied together. No, no Will, Will is, is right, right on the right shelf. On this it's gross. <laughs> There's actually a really, really fascinating book called Misquoting Jesus that's about um, the translation of the Bible throughout history. And you realize that there is no specific Bible. It's a bunch of different Bibles that people picked. Also, the way... It gets even weirder. The way people translated things in the past, they weren't actually, like, they didn't have, like, sentences or a standardized way of writing. So a bunch of people would write things in different ways. It was also accepted that you were buying, like, an artisanal Bible and that, like, it would have the specific flair of whoever wrote it so they might change things. There was no idea that this needs to be an accurate word-for-word -word translation. There's just a bunch of monks who get bored and write, like, cats licking their buttholes in the little illuminations. Five or six different languages, a bunch of scribes who don't write the same way, so they don't even necessarily understand exactly what the person they're copying says. They understand that, like, hey, you can copy things non-literally, like, you're not supposed to. Um, and then, of course, there's a the whole, like, which books they kept in the Bible and then, like, which versions they decided to keep and then doctrine changed and then there's the whole catholics and canon um stuff we've gotten very off topic and it's going to take us forever if we do this I, I think it's important in terms of talking about the religious themes because that's me most of the oh that's that's the a book. fair point yeah let's get then do you have i don't i don't i'm not very knowledgeable on this subject so i don't have a lot i can say all i would really say is that i think it's something that the author is interested in but he doesn't necessarily explore enough with the characters part of it i think is he has so many characters he introduces a character and then he introduces another one and there's no like mid points there's no like dark night of the soul moment for abelard he just kind of like does a thing and does a thing and runs from a shadow i think he wants it to i i think it was supposed to be a minor theme but i think the more important aspect that the author wanted to focus on was the story itself so I don't think the themes come together as cleanly due to the not it like that's just not the emphasis. OK, and so they get to the place. Uh, Tara meets Abelard. Abelard, again, is the one who saw there when God died. They decide that the priest is like, you got to figure out who did this. And then um, they go to the library and she basically creates a 3D model from the library of Koss's body, visualizing all of the packs he had made um and it is a very cool scene it is a sick scene yeah for all of this is a very hard magic system it's very creepy still because it's literally like Koss's body is like a monstrously huge land that they are standing on and not just that i think even more interestingly is that um so in order to access this vision, they both have to share their blood in this uh, steel bowl or this iron bowl, excuse me. And it's part of the magic system. And so what they can do is is be, um, if they were to try to crunch the data on their own, it would be insane and it would take years. But what they can do is they can visualize it physically and view it metaphorically, which is really fun. But I think what was creepiest about this scene 
was that um, it's described as so they're standing on the the cool pallid corks of Kos. And Koss is gigantic to the point where his wounds are like lakes of blood um, mm-hmm. or ichor, excuse me. And um, but just beyond their vision in the darkness are these swirly manifesting Cthulhu vibes. And um, it's in this like metaphysical zone, like just beyond what their bubble contains to understand this concept is something else. And then also, um, as they're investigating and they're looking at the wounds and the wounds are metaphors for all the, uh, for uh, not all the wounds, but some of the areas are metaphors for the contracts that he had that are connected to certain vital points in his body. As they uh, rise up to get a bird's eye view later on, uh, Tara notices that Koss's face is twisted into a knowing smile and it's just really creepy that there's this giant and i just almost imagine like the pale bald men from uh <laughs> from what's it called the alien movie um p p uh, prometheus um i just imagine the giant pale dudes from prometheus but he's like dead and pale and like bloody except with black blood and stuff and with like gross parasites on him, but he's smiling and it's very eerie. Yeah, it's a good scene. Um, And that's one of the things I think that the author does. What I liked how the magic worked in this book in that it is very weird. One of the things I talked about in Nine Fox Gambit was that there was a very hard magic system in there because the characters could understand it um, and would use it very clinically, but we didn't really understand it. We made it not a soft magic system. It just made it ambiguous. Um, and one of the things I complained about was that like, there's never any sense that the author understands how the magic system works. There's never any details. Like They enter like formations, but it's never explained. Is that hexagonal? Is that an actual geometric shape? Is it not? That kind of stuff. This book doesn't do that. Um, There is a clear sense that the author knows what's going on and we get like little explanations for how powers work. But at the same time, I still did not quite understand how magic worked in this world and that made some of the words i didn't either yeah and it made some of what was going on feel fuzzy at times like i could understand the emotion that Arthur wanted to import but i didn't really understand the the power flip um the the you know it's one of those books where like people do stuff with magic that's unprecedented and they're like oh they use these two rules together and i was like i didn't quite ever understand that on its own um without uh, the author telling me exactly what was going on. Some putting that through some type of tool to describe it. And and that's one of the things I think that leads the world to feel a little distant and floaty is that I didn't quite know what was going on with the magic. It's not a massive problem, but it is a bit of a problem. Prior to this, uh, Tara had had the um, responsibility of visiting a colleague of uh, Miss Kavarian's, which was a judge. And when she went to go meet this judge, she found that he had been murdered. Um, when she uh, she does a little finagling with justice and she's like, or the black suits, excuse me. Um, and she says, you know, I'm a, a registered certified craftswoman. I can go in there and take a look and make an evaluation of the body. And so she goes in there and she notices that there has been some craft work done. Um, they used his bones in order they basically shredded him from the inside out and ripped out his spine and his brain and everything. And they made it so that way he could feel things for much longer time and also could potentially speak, um, but it had been disrupted. And so that in and of itself is curious because what craftsperson is going to be doing this? That's very strange. But then also the way the body has been killed is really super insane. And as she's looking for clues, she noticed some gargoyles and specifically one is alive and his name is Shale and Shale comes down and is kind of hot. Yeah, I thought that was going to go somewhere in the book like a romance and then it just didn't. No, he's just cute. He comes down and she's like, I'm sure you're innocent. And I don't know where this comes from. I think it's because of the craft stuff. She thinks it has to do with maybe somebody with the craft as, as opposed to, um, uh, you know, a, a gargoyle. But anyway, she essentially is like, hey, no, let me help you. Let me help you. And <laughs> she tricks him, tears, uh, excuse me, cuts off his face 
and leaves him faceless and is like, oh my God, there's a faceless body. Who knew? Because these gargoyles can transfer from stone guardian into flesh and blood. And so he was in flesh and blood when she cut off his face and stuck it in a book. Um, and then in her purse. The um, thing about it, though, is that you can basically, as long as you bring the body, the, the face back to the body, it can just be brought back to life. It's not like dead, dead. It's just yeah. kind of inconvenienced for a while. Um, and this is one of the places where, like, the book doesn't really tell you that this is a bad thing. Um, and so you're left with a little bit to interpret it on your own. It's, again, Tara doing something, a very decisive action, which helps characterize her. And at the time, I was like, okay, so this isn't dead, dead. Like, we're not supposed to... You know how, like, in Looney Tunes, when somebody gets hit by a hammer, they don't have, like, concussions for days at a time? Like, you're, you understand that you're not necessarily metaphorically supposed to... You're not supposed to always interpret books entirely literally. And in this world, maybe that's just kind of like taking somebody into, like, custody or something is taking off their face. But um, in this case, I think it's supposed to read as ambiguous because it's kind of like, this is her controlling somebody else without really like asking for consent and she does call herself on it out on it twice where she feels very uncomfortable with that that move she made but she knows that Kavarian would um approve well the other thing is i think it's i i actually i like the action even if it's not a good action it's a decisive action and it's okay to have some like grayness in your character um though in this book i i wouldn't say that I, she does like two or three gray things, but then like the rest of the book, she basically is still doing the right thing. And then for some reason, she has a very strong feeling about doing the right thing for the gargoyles later. Um, that makes her seem like everything she did was good. I, I got like, so there were two things with that in particular. I felt like she had a weirdly, a weird soft spot for the gargoyles that made no sense. It's because even from the get go, why did she think Shale was innocent? Why did she think that that was not, yeah. like, I don't remember. I think it can be inferred, but it's never really substantiated by the text that she does this because she is worried about the mob coming out. Like, that's her driving motivation is the mob will come after me because I'm a witch and an outsider, so I feel bad for these other outsiders. The connection is never actually made in the book, though, and, and the problem is that the book tells you so many things that if it doesn't tell you something, I don't really necessarily think it. it it's, it's one of those books where you're... Um, your expectation of how it's communicating with you is set at a certain level. And so when it way underplays that, I don't really necessarily think it, it works very well. Um, you kind of have to keep a certain amount of consistent communication with the reader in terms of what type it is. Um, I think that's like, I would say literary theory. I really should actually search. Yeah, okay, so I was right before. It's because uh, she'd seen the craft from before. So yeah, okay. Then I thought I thought that was established, but I felt like maybe I just made that up and she'd made that connection later on in the book, but I guess not. And so one of the things is that after this, she was she wants to talk to the head on its own, but she only is ever able to do it like once or twice in the book, which is weird because I kind of thought that was going to be a much larger piece. I thought um, he was going to be a constant character in the book, but instead she has to like, like she nails later on when they have a a, a respite uh she asks for a wig uh a wig holder and she nails the face to it and like talks to it which was kind of fun but um that was before she and abelard had gone to the library and everything so um so to catch up on speed all of that is i think the majority of the important stuff that happens and then we get past the scene where they inspect the corpse of Koss. So the next big thing, okay, not the next big thing, but the next thing, big thing I remember and I think is important is that they are searching for like some captain to figure out something. Okay, so what happened is that Koss had a um, an emergency like mana lever with this one nation where if they suddenly needed magic they could get it from him and it looks like when they tried to get it from him that's when he died but Tara's like that doesn't make any sense it could never have pulled that much power unless he was way underpowered so they needed to figure out they had this pirate that they knew and they need to find him and he's a vampire so Abelard's like hey I have this friend who's like basically half policewoman half vampire junkie uh let's go meet her and that's Kat and Kat is actually kind of a nice character because she is like she she feels when she feels a connection with her god justice and and she is a black suit so when god inhabits her there is a connection there and a, and a power and a um 
It is an addictiveness to it. And when she doesn't have that going on, she has to go search out for vampires so they can like bleed her and do the whole. She gets high off of the, yeah. And she's a fun character. I liked her. It's it's kind of an interesting idea. And I like that it, it kind of helps characterize Abelard, I think, in that the two of them were friends at one point. Um, and this is how they know each other. Um, and so they go and... There, I wish I had a physical copy of this book so badly. It's because I would love to reread the the description or that, that one line I told you about. There's this one line and it is literally the best written line in the entire piece. It, it, it contends with one other line, but it's when Tara is asking Abelard whether or not Kat has always had this personality or whether it had, and I don't remember the verb that was used, but it was such a good verb. And it sounded like encrusted, and but it, it had like encrusted or something condensed like a pearl in her over time. That was such a beautiful line. So Judo, she says about Kat, like she doesn't have any identity outside of her job and her story is about reclaiming her autonomy. This is another example where I think the author sets up a situation and then doesn't explore that. Um, she, you know, she she goes full culty member, um, but it's also explained that some of what she does later in the book is because she was, uh, Tara screwed with her mind a little bit. And then she just kind of has all of a sudden at the end, she has a moment where she's like, no, I got to turn around and, and do this thing outside of justice. A pearl of fire. I remember this line, too. Yeah, it was good. I don't remember what it was, but I do do remember it, too. It's another example, I think, where there aren't steps Oh, on my her. God, Lindbergh. How are you like this? How do you do this? Was she born with that attitude or did it accrete on her with irritation like an irascible pearl? Yeah, it's a good line. Um, the author can write pretty well at times. It's nothing that, like is showy, but it definitely works really well. I think her growth is something where there's not steps in the growth. There's just, this is the initial situation, and then at the end of the book, I changed my mind. The other big thing that happens after this is a trial, which this is something where, okay, necromancer lawyers um, is such a cool idea, and then the trial scene is basically two mages having a mind fight. It's not, that's one of the things that's sort of disappointing about the book is there's not actually a lot of lawyering going on. And you would think there would be, but there just isn't. It's really more of like a detective novel. Um, but basically she meets Donovan, who, I know it's De Novo, um, who was, um, who was um, this, the mage professor who threw her out. And her whole thing we find out later is that he was basically controlling the minds of his students to create a hive mind, to give him more power. And like his whole motivation is that he wants to be a god. Like right now, mages can live forever, but they turn into skeletons and like cold or statues. Um, and he wants to be able to be, live forever, but not be like that. And I actually liked him as, an, as a character. He's evil and he's not very original, but like the way he twirls his mustache has a nice flair to it. Like to, to use a, a simile right there, like it, it he's, he's fun. And especially his dialogue I felt like was fun. I really enjoyed his character. It's because it reminded me of a, it was unexpected, his physical description with his personality because his physical description is that of like a football coach, basically <laughs> a, a, a professor football coach. Um, somebody who wears a sports coat, but like has like a jowly face and a big bushy beard. So kind of like a, um, a, what you would imagine like a philosophy professor, or not even a philosophy professor, no, like a computer person at a like, I don't know, I'm being pretty judgy here, I feel like by even describing that. <laughs> There's an ordinariness but, to him that I liked in, in, yeah. in contrast to. And I liked his, his introduction a lot, like how it was described, how so there, his introduction is uh, not, it, it describes his um, classroom, his lab, and it describes how everybody is like ticking, 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 just like his clock, which is only alluded to like twice. Um, so I thought that was a nice soft little theme in the background is that like sort of all in ticking time where everybody just like passes one to the other and they're all working in perfect harmony. And then you get that little gross slip of him where he looks at one of his students firm calves underneath her lab coat. And I was like, ugh. It's so gross when men are into calves. Am I right? Calves are just not the sexiest part of the body. I was grossed out for that reason too, Katie. No, no, it, it was, <laughs> I just really like that he's like so pompous 
and that he does that. I really liked his entire character persona. Like it's not it's not a unique one that I haven't seen before, but it has unique flares to it, which was cool. I think this is an, a place where the cascade failure can be a problem in that if you already are feeling distant from the book and feel like the characters are ciphers, he is going to feel like a cipher to you. And just kind of annoying and cliche. Um, and so I think it's a, it's something that's very reader dependent. Um, one thing uh, Chris had said about the lawyer fight. It's a good written fight, but a horrible example of legal fights. They hardly talked at all. I was so looking forward to verbal sparring. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. It's a good scene and it's a good mage fight, but um, it's not it's not really a lawyering which would have been cool because like the judge is basically just a conduit to the gods so that the lawyers can speak to them but then they just show up and are like fighting over Casa's corpse to see if he can pull more power to prove that the because basically the whole thing is that the credit the debtors the creditors um who uh were pulling from costs are going to sue the church because if the church is found liable for overdrawing Casa's power then they're financially liable and bad things will happen to them and stuff like that. And then when Koss is reborn, they'll be like less in control or something like that. Um, and so that's what DeNovo is trying to prove. And uh, Kavarian is there to prove that the church didn't do that. The only thing I wish was different about the scene in the courtroom is that I kind of wish that when they were mage battling, it was a, a play on words or something, or there was something that happened where, because it's described metaphorically as if De Novo is weaving his thorns in and out of Koss's body, like as if he's trying to find holes in the, um, you know, it, it's a metaphor for the, the finding holes in the litigation. Um, but then she is also fighting back. But it, it would have been very cool if like he had cut open costs and said, hey, look at this clause. It says whatever, whatever. But yeah, it's visualized that's what I mean. as like a kidney. Yeah, that would have been or, very cool. Or like like the reading of guts kind of thing. You know, that's what yeah, I was augers. expecting. Yeah, that's what I was expecting or hoping for, I should say. It's not what I was expecting. It was what I was hoping for because they'd already built that up so much before. I thought they were going to do more of that. But what you also learn in the scene is um, that De Novo is actually drawing power from his lab, from all of his mind-controlled students. Um, all of them are basically doing the work for him. And it's kind of like he has a computer behind him or um, crunching the numbers. And so he's able yeah. to use all of that information in, uh, as power. And he's using that against Tara and Tara ends up overcoming him by throwing all of the unfiltered information from the library previous. And instead of the metaphorical body being used to read that data, she just throws the data at him. And even with all of his students behind him, it can't like it, it's just not going to generate that quick. So he basically blue screens and. Uh, shuts down and he's like, okay, I guess that's it for today. And then they, <laughs> they, they have to take a recess. Side note, before I forget, because this just popped up in my head. They, ugh, this writer is such a nerd. He threw in, um, uh, what's her name? Uh, Morticia and what's his face? Oh God, why am I dying right now? From the Adams family. Morticia Gomez. and, uh, yeah. Gomez. Uh, Morticia and Gomez are in the Zambala. Uh, tangoing at one point. It's oh, described. Oh, is that the? Oh, that's yeah, clever. it's really funny. But anyway, uh, that's not what I was actually going to mention. But what I was going to mention is that it is revealed to us when he asks her out on a date that De Novo and, well, specifically, uh, uh, Miss Kavarian actually loved De Novo, uh, genuinely, and he mm -hmm. took advantage of that love and mind her basically, and uh took advantage of her in a um, in a rough draft version of his lab and classroom. She's learned from it. And I liked that she was not weak to his advances. She does not love him anymore. She thinks he is disgusting. And I really like that it was kind of ambiguously uh, like waded through at the beginning of their reunion. Yeah. And then it revealed itself that she is not at all weak to his advances. But unfortunately, he does weave some wordplay and end up putting her underneath some type of um, craft that disallows Spell. her from having free will. Yeah. 
And that keeps her from the big fight towards the end, which I was like, of course, you're going to take out the the uh, <laughs> one character that could probably decimate everyone. That could do really good. Yeah, it, it's it also it makes him a clever villain, um, which I think, again, I think he works well as a villain. I think he gets defeated too easily by Terra. He's built up as just like so clever and 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 powerful and then it's like but remember tara doesn't defeat him right but he still gets defeated like by cost and so the big thing that comes up is that the gargoyles have were okay so when cyril died not all of her actually died some of her went to be with the gargoyles um basically only the parts of her that were being loved and loved back like uh, in terms of they only have that closeness with the god not the power it was because they were fighting with her on the fighting fields it's described that the gargoyles by the way if we have not said this the gargoyles are basically her children her creations mm -hmm. and they were the original black suits that kept peace in the city but more batman style did you ever watch the animated series yes of, yeah that was oh exactly what i meant okay so the scene where it's it's like, and uh, it's like we, uh, and we, oh, uh, and awoke or something like that, and it's like, it's such a good entrance song. Anyway, sorry, I get really passionate about the Gargoyles animated series. That's prime Monster Boy for material, so I'm sure Maria would understand if she was here. Anyway, it's said that the Gargoyles that were left in the city to take care of the city are the ones that actually went mad to a certain degree because they did not know that their goddess was still alive, whereas the ones that had been fighting us. Uh, side by side with her had kept some of her in their hearts. And so what happens is uh, we find out that Koss didn't actually know that part of Cyril was still alive, that that had been hidden by the Pope, the fire Pope. I don't remember what his name is. Um, and because he didn't want the city to be like, he wanted it to be just Koss's city. He didn't want it to be shared with Cyril, um, which goes to like man trying to control God type of a theme. Um, and then there's a big fight and we find out that De Novo was trying to, was setting this all up so that when they resurrect Koss, he would be resurrected. He, all that power would go to him and he would actually be a god. Um, which, as motivation felt a little bit meh. It did feel met to me. I was not overly, like, I just got a watered down version of um, Judge... Uh, Oh, I'm just bad with names today, man. Judge what's his face from uh, Froyo. Frollo. Yes, from Notre Dame. Uh, that's what the Cardinal Gustav reminded me of was Judge Froyo. Frollo. Yeah, that's actually a very good. There's even uh, that would have been funny, too, especially with the gargoyles in it. I'm losing to a bird. If you ever watched Lindsay Ellis, you'll remember that reference. I know exactly. That would have been great. Yeah, he felt like a little bit of a watered down Frollo to me. Because part of what makes Frollo works is his inner like lust for for esmeralda what makes him feel very twisted and gross oh i love and there's that that, that passion that scene. he wants yeah exactly like and he wants god's love and and um this fire pope he's not really on screen enough he mostly is both uh, the other thing is about halfway through the book you realize it's going to be him because it's conservation of characters there's not no one else it could be that would be satisfying yeah. um and so it feels a little flat it's not the worst problem but it's, it's not great um and so they defeat de novo because of some like magical craft wrangling stuff they're in the hall of justice because justice in cat uh, through cat's body as well as many others captured the gargoyles as well as Tara, believing them to actually have been the murderers. Um, uh, so vampire pirate captain is also there. Abelard, thank you, is there. And um, everyone's there. And uh, Miss Kavarian can't move because of the spell that's on her. And so she slowly but surely uses her own blood to go in a circle and like twitch her way into making a resurrection circle where Abelard is later. During this series of events, it's basically Terra versus De Novo for the most part. At one point, Terra gets gut punched, uh, D DBZ style, and uh, Cyril inhabits her body and like comes at him with, through Terra's body for a hot second. But I felt like that was like a lame scene in my opinion. I think my opinion, that was one of the weaker power scenes. Oh, actually I saw somebody did um, fan art for the final battle scene. Here, let me show it. On oh, screen. did they really? Let me see. Yeah, yeah, let me show it. It's really cool looking. There we go. See, um, and this is what it's supposed to look like when all the gargoyles are gathered before the big fight. Uh, um, I thought it was pretty cool. Audio listeners, I pulled up um, a picture of the gargoyles animated TV show. 
um, and uh, it's peak '90s uh, cartoons. So. I'm gonna piss myself. I'm fucking dead. <laughs> I was really expecting. <laughs> I thought you were gonna be straight laced for the first time ever, <laughs> and I was still. I should have just kept with my gut. Uh, Tara does a lot of the fighting with DeNovo, but then so Abelard tackles him at one point, like he tackles everybody else in this book, as someone said before. And then Abelard is basically killed by him, um, but within this resurrection circle where Miss Kavarian is. And the um, gargoyles have been released by Cat uh, because Cat realizes, "Whoa, I done fucked up," and uh, they're all fighting and dying, and they're gonna lose. But then Kavarian's uh, resurrection circle resurrects Cost from the cigarette, the burning cherry of the cigarette that Abelard has, which is cool as hell. I thought that was so cool. So basically, the idea is that this whole time. Um, Abelard has had a, has been smoking a cigarette and he's always like instead of putting a new match he's been connecting one cigarette and lighting it with the other and um Koss had been hiding in the ember of that cigarette as it came alive the whole time um yeah which I thought was I thought it was really cute I liked it I thought that was clever I thought that was super cool and then um of course once Koss comes back round and Kavarian is free again um everything comes together uh and then you know Cyril and uh Koss have their uh reunion scene in the metaphysical bar. Basically what happens is that um, we have the wrap up scene where um, De Novo has been captured, Koss is back, but they're like, ooh, what's going on with Serial? We don't know like how that's gonna work with this new world. Um, uh, Abelard, uh, the last scene you have of Abelard, I actually really liked. Um, it's cause it's him going to light the fire for Koss at the end and God speaks to him. And what's hilarious is it's a very ordinary voice that's kind of just like, hey, what's up dude? Like, I just liked that understatement of it. I thought that was very nice. The other thing that happens is that Miss Kavarian is like packing up and her and like Tara are gonna go on to the next um, job mission. There's like something with sea serpents or something. And Tara's like, hey, I really appreciate what you did for me, but I think I need to stay and take care of this city. It needs to be healed. And you as the reader are like, what? what? <laughs> I did not buy that. Literally my thought was like, Oh, the author wanted to stay in this city, and so he just was like, the character wants to do this. That did not make sense. It's supposed to be like her culmination in not wanting to turn into one of the deathless kings and keep her humanity. And maybe you could connect it back to like wanting to be part of something, but like I never felt like that was a very strong motivation. But even if that was the case, Kavarian says, well, when I'm done with that job, I'll drop back around because and collect you. It's because you're still going to be my assistant. So and then and then Tara's like, oh, yeah, sure. Like she doesn't say anything against that. So it's gonna be that way. And then also side note, we didn't describe this. It's because we kind of zoomed over it. But earlier on when uh, Miss Kavarian met with um, Devolo on their pseudo date. Devolo, that is such a good, that is such a good combination of names. I know, DeNovo, whatever, point is. Deno Devolo is a better one. I like it, keep going. When they were leaving their date together, um, he ends up kissing her, uh, not with her consent. And uh, as they're kissing, he, from his perspective, he notes that there's a strange taste from her mouth. And he's thinking, huh, even when she's this, tw like, all caught up in my spell, she's still trying her best. Good for her. And uh, just leaves it at that. But then when he's in his cell at the, like, epilogue, it's, like, gotta be my second favorite scene. And so uh, he's in his cell and uh, she goes down to visit him and he's just finished lunch or so. And she's talking to him and saying, you know, they're going to figure out what to do with you, so on and so forth. And he's like, oh, my dear, uh, you know, like happy as a pig in sloth. And he's more thinking along the lines, no, nah, I'll be out of here soon. I've got friends in high places. He's like, oh, my plan has is complete you know i i took everything into account it's great here you can't actually affect me nothing can pass through these bars it's a prison but i'm actually safe and they're not going to kill me anyway ha 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 yeah smart. so i'll just get out sooner or later and then you know i'll see you then and then i'll uh and then twirling mustache and then i'll come visit you and miss tara <laughs> and uh anyway there's this moment where they both like are acknowledging something or whatever and they close their eyes and they use their second sight and it's he says he almost sees instead of miss kavarian he sees a large python 
almost like licking its tongue against the barrier, like just to confirm that indeed she can't pass through it. Um, and he's just like, ah, oh, that's kind of chilling, but whatever, she can't do anything. And then um, she then begins to speak about how Evelard had run away from this shadow creature that um, Devolo had trapped earlier on for another plot point. Doesn't matter. The point is, is that he had trapped it with this dagger. And she was like, yes, it's quite lucky that I came along when I did and rescued the poor boy from it. He was absolutely terrified. And then she was like, and I ate it, but I didn't consume it. I kept it within me. And then he has a flashback to the kiss and the strange taste that he had. And so he's got this rabid shadow creature inside of him. And uh, she's like, ah, it, it, it was so nice seeing you again, kind of thing. And he's like, no, n you won't do this. Da, 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 da. And then she just cuts him off and then just like, it's a great comeuppance for the character for, for the character who was in control the whole time um and i really liked it i thought it was it was a really good scene i mean this is one of the things i mean when i say that the books are like competent in a way that a lot of the books we've read aren't um though you know and that's more or less the end of the book and so you know to to kind of talk about it as a whole i think there's definitely I definitely understand why some people don't connect with this book. Yeah, and it me does too. not work for them. Like I get that. It's got a lot of elements. Yeah, and again, to me, like I, I if I was a normal reader and not reading for this this uh, channel where I have to read a book a week and essentially every book we do has to be worth doing a video on, I would probably have like checked out the second book. Apparently, there's like a bunch. There's like eight works in this series. Also, they don't come back to Terra and Kaverian until like the fifth book. I hate that shit. I'm sorry. I hate series that go to other characters. Oh, yeah. They're indifferent. What's interesting is that when the, the end of the book happens, she's like, I'm going to stay here. I'm like, oh, that's actually almost like a little bit of a mistake because this the thing the, the thing the author did that I found very valuable was his world building. And if we stay in the city, we're not going to find out really new, cool world building things. So it kind of makes sense then, actually, that they would, for debut, this it's really fun. This is a debut this is a debut. lovely debut novel. It's pronounced debut. It is a lovely debut novel. Yeah, I don't think it's bad. I think I think it could do with reworking. I think his style won't connect with everyone. I don't know. I actually would. I am now a little bit curious about the sequels because I did just like I find the world so interesting. Well, I'll read it with you. It's be and Maria read this book too, so she can actually be a part of it. The sequels do so badly on the channel <laughs> that I'm like, mm. I don't know. Sometimes I want to read a books too, and I want part of like um we read the Kushio uh, trilogy. And like, I want to read the fourth book, but I also know it's 20 hours long and I'm only going to like be interested in about 10 hours of that, like spread out through the book. I just want to know kind of what happens to the characters. But anyway, thank you all for joining us. If you would like to join us in the future for these super cool live streams and get exclusive footage of our pets, um, join the Patreon. Um, it is a fun time. You also get access to... Um, Exclusive videos, um, you get access to uh, ones me and Katie do of critiquing uh, specific chapters. I like to call these reviews our macro thoughts on a work and those are our micro thoughts on a work. And if you, if anyone is interested, I am currently uh, open for jobs. If you would like any developmental help or editing help, uh, just email me at betareadingbykatie at gmail.com. And uh, all right, sign us out. Thanks for watching and listening. Yours truly. Unresolved textual tension. Have a great day.